Well, if you've been in, your, in church for any portion of your life, you've probably heard some words and phrases that are commonly referred to as Christianese. These are words and phrases that are commonly used in churches that have little meaning to those outside the church. One example would be a hedge of protection. When I was a kid, I heard people pray all the time that God would place a hedge of protection around someone. And as a kid, all I could think of was some divinely appointed shrubbery springing up around a person. I would think, how is a bush going to protect this person? In the world that we live in, that's not a phrase that you find anywhere but churches. Another Christianese word is fellowship. Now, the definition of fellowship is much more clear than a hedge of protection, but it's still not a word that we really hear people use very much outside of church. Here at church, we might say that we're going to have a fellowship meal, or we might refer to hanging around after church and talking to people as fellowshipping. Outside of a church context, we really don't find that word being used in that way very much. When I was in college, there was a Buffalo Wild Wings right across the street from the school, and I never had one of my friends say to me, hey man, this Friday we're all going to go fellowship over some wings. When I started dating Brittany, I never said, hey, how would you like to go out for some fellowship? One last example of Christianese that came to my mind this week was words that we use to relate to the gospel or theology. In the increasingly secular culture that we live in, we can't just jump right into using Bible terminology and expect people to understand what we're talking about. Even in our area, we live in the Bible Belt, and you'd be surprised at how many people don't have an understanding of Bible terms. For instance, my parents were unsaved when I was born, and my mom told me a few years back about how when I was a little baby, my great-grandmother was rocking me and singing, There is a fountain filled with blood. And my mom, who hadn't grown up in church and was unsaved, said that her first thought was, This woman is in a cult, and I need to get my baby away from her. <laughs> We have to be very careful to make sure that when we use certain Bible terms, those around us, and just as importantly, we ourselves understand what they mean. And as I was studying the verse of the Lord's Prayer that I'm going to be speaking to you about this morning, it occurred to me that it contains two phrases that we as Christians commonly use, but very often don't totally understand. And so today, it is my prayer that at the end of this message, all of us would have a more clear understanding of just what Jesus meant when he gave this pattern for prayer. So we're going to turn our attention to God's word, but first let's take a moment and pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that it does work in our hearts to change us to be more like you. Lord, we thank you for the ways that we've already been able to worship you this morning. And Lord, as I preach your word, I pray that you would just help me to get out of the way and allow your spirit to speak through your word. God, I pray that you would use me in a way that I can't use myself. Lord, I pray that your word would speak to the hearts of everyone here and help us to know more about you and to be more like you. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we're going to continue our series on the Lord's Prayer. And if you missed Pastor Doug's message last week introducing this series, I would encourage you to go back this week and listen to that message. Turn in your Bibles, if you're not already there, to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 10 is where we're going to be today. Looking here in this passage, Jesus is giving an example of some principles to look to in our own prayer life. And here in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 10, Jesus says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In this verse, we see two terms that are often used by Christians and are seldom clearly defined. The first that we'll be looking at today is the concept of God's kingdom. In this verse, we are commanded to pray that God's kingdom would come. The two questions that this phrase raises are, one, what is this kingdom? And number two, why should we pray that it will come? Let's begin by taking a look at the first question. What is the kingdom? This is a concept that is seen throughout the Bible. Uh, Now, 
whether you're following along through the app or whether you've got the old school paper notes, I've left some room this morning to mark down some of the Bible references that I'll be using. And as we go through this, my goal is that you would understand the kingdom of God better. But my goal is not just that you would understand it better based on what I've said to you here today. Ultimately, everything that we believe must be based on the word of God. And so I would ask you as we go through some different scripture references just to mark down what these are so that you can know why, based on the word of God, you believe what you believe. So let's start in Genesis. At creation, God blessed Adam and Eve and told them to fill the earth, to subdue and rule over it. At the beginning of the world, God set in place a system whereby mankind would rule over the earth for the glory of God. As we also read in Genesis, Adam and Eve failed in that task as they sinned against God. Adam and Eve's sin means that man in his fallen state can never live up to the potential that was inherent in God's design. And so throughout the Old Testament, we see God laying the groundwork to restore his kingdom on earth. In Genesis 12, God makes a covenant with Abraham that he is going to work through Abraham's lineage as a vehicle through which to bless the world. He also promises Abraham a land, an earthly kingdom that will be an example to the nations of his blessings. Later on in the Old Testament, God made a covenant with David in 2 Samuel chapter 10, in which he promised David that David's lineage would be used by God to establish his kingdom on earth. And in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel saw these covenants partially fulfilled in their midst, yet they turned away from God and their earthly kingdom did not last. And yet even in the midst of that, as the nation of Israel is turning away from God and rejecting his blessings, God promises in Ezekiel 36 that one day he will establish a kingdom in which he will give them new hearts and send his Holy Spirit to live in them. And the nation of Israel held on to these promises. And so as Jesus appears on the scene hundreds of years later, there is a sense of great expectation among the people of Israel. God has promised to establish his kingdom on earth. And in doing that, he has promised to give to the nation of Israel a land to call their own and great spiritual blessings. If you were to ask someone who was alive at the time of Christ what was meant by God's kingdom, the answer that they would give you would likely revolve around the establishment of God's kingdom on earth and the fulfillment of his promises to his chosen people, Israel. And when you read the gospel accounts of Jesus' life, in his early ministry, we find Jesus talking about God's kingdom as being very near. John the Baptist preached in Matthew 3 that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Jesus himself in Matthew 10, 5 and 7 instructed his disciples to go exclusively to the people of Israel and announce to them that God's kingdom was at hand. Sadly, the people of Israel rejected the kingdom of God even as it was being offered to them. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 to 32, they even go so far as to attribute the works of Christ to the power of Satan. And so as the life and ministry of Jesus progresses, we see a shift in the way that he talks about the kingdom. He begins to teach that one day in the future, he will return to earth and establish his kingdom at that point. The rest of the New Testament affirms the fact that one day Jesus Christ will return to earth in power and glory, and at that point will establish the earthly kingdom of God. However, the New Testament writers also include some interesting writings on the topic of God's kingdom that seem to apply to our present day. For instance, in Colossians 1.13, Paul writes that believers have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's Son. The Bible also says in Romans 14, 17, that believers can experience kingdom righteousness in their own lives. Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, 9, that we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. So the question that is before us here is how do these different descriptions of God's kingdom fit together? If we have prophecies in Scripture about Christ coming to establish God's kingdom on earth, 
that haven't been fulfilled yet. And then over here we have verses about Christians living as citizens of God's kingdom right now. We have to ask if these are talking about different things. And so the approach that some theologians take is to split these out into various kingdoms of God. I was reading one theologian in particular this week who believes that there are four separate kingdoms of God. And that any time a Bible passage says anything different about the kingdom of God, it must be talking about a different kingdom. Personally, I'm not a big fan of that interpretation. To me, it seems like it's making the Bible needlessly complicated and imposing definitions of Scripture upon Scripture that it doesn't place upon itself. If you disagree with me, I'd love to discuss it with you sometime this week. But personally, I side with the weight of evangelical scholarship that takes a much more unified view of the Bible's presentation of the kingdom of God. I was reading John MacArthur's work on this subject this week, and he put it so well that I'm not even going to try and paraphrase it in my own words. I'm just going to read, it, read for you his description of the kingdom. Listen to what MacArthur writes. The divine, eternal, triune God literally created a kingdom and two kingdom citizens who were to have dominion over it. But an enemy usurped their rightful allegiance to the king and captured the original kingdom citizens. God intervened with consequential curses that exist to this day. Ever since, God has been redeeming sinful, rebellious people to be restored as qualified kingdom citizens, both now in a spiritual sense and later in a kingdom on earth sense. Finally, the enemy will be vanquished forever, as will sin. Thus, Revelation 21 and 22 describes the final and eternal expression of the kingdom of God, in which the eternal triune God will restore the kingdom to its original purity, removing the curse and establishing the new heaven and the new earth as the everlasting abode of God and his people. Now that was a long quote, and you may not have picked up on everything that he was saying, but what you really need to take away from that is that we are citizens of the kingdom of God now in a spiritual sense, and we await the establishment of God's kingdom in an earthly sense. So that was basically a long detour to bring us all the way back around to Matthew 6.10. Jesus commanded the crowd gathered for his Sermon on the Mount that they should pray that God's kingdom would come. And just for a moment, try and place yourself in the sandals of someone who is sitting there listening to this. Knowing what we know about the progress of God revealing truth through the Bible, do you think that the people sitting there would have been thinking about the kingdom in its literal sense, as revealed in the Old Testament, or in its spiritual sense that is more fully revealed in the New Testament. Does anybody have any guesses? What what, what do you think they would have been thinking about? I'm hearing a lot of murmurs, but I'll take, take it that you said the right thing. Knowing what we know about the testimony of Scripture, it is almost certain that they would have been thinking about the coming of God's kingdom in its literal sense. So while it may be tempting to impose our own meaning over the top of this text or to try to find some deeper spiritual meaning, we must remember that the Bible doesn't contain various layers of meaning. God intends for his word to be understood by all people everywhere. And there's not one meaning for some people and another meaning for someone else. Jesus Christ is commanding these people to pray that God's kingdom would come here on earth. And as readers of God's word, we are to be doing the same. This brings us to the second question that we need to work through, which is why should we pray for this? Why should we pray that God's kingdom would come and be established on earth? Well, for one thing, as has been said before, so often our prayers reflect our heart. You are going to want to pray for the things that you value the most. And you're going to want others to pray about that as well. We should long for God's kingdom to be established on earth. That longing should not be selfish. We shouldn't long for God's kingdom to come so that all of our enemies can finally get what's coming to them or so that we can finally kick back and relax. Remember, we are to pray that God's 
kingdom would come, not our kingdom. We should long for God to be glorified, and we should long for the day when he receives the glory that he deserves as king. We should long to see the completion of God's plan of redemption when all is made new and we will dwell in the presence of God. We should long to see the fulfillment of all of God's promises. We should be kingdom-minded people. Our hearts should cry out for the day when God establishes his kingdom here on earth. And our prayer life should reflect that. A constant feature of our prayers ought to be your kingdom come. Secondly, this morning, I'd like to take a look at the second part of this verse, your will be done. The second part of this verse commands us to pray that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Once again, the questions that this places before us are, what does the will of God mean in this particular context? And why is God commanding us to pray that it would be done on earth as it is in heaven? So let's first examine this question of what is the will of God? This can at times become one of those Christianese phrases that we use without really thinking about what it means. For instance, sometimes we use this phrase to try and place God's stamp of approval on our own plans. I've heard people say things before like, well, this is what I want, and I know that God wants me to be happy, therefore this is God's will. So let's take a look at what exactly the Bible means when it talks about God's will. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 1.11 that God works all things according to the counsel of his will. Isaiah 14.24 says, The Lord of hosts has sworn, As I have planned, so shall it be, and as I have purposed, so shall it stand. Isaiah 46.9 and 10 says, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. The Bible is clear that God in his sovereignty is in complete control of the progress of history and has planned the events that will come to pass to bring about the purpose of his will. We read in Philippians chapter 2 that the purpose of this is that all of history is building toward the moment when God and the person of Jesus Christ will receive the glory that he deserves. The purpose of history is the glory of God. And God can see the end from the beginning. He has a much broader perspective than we do. When we look at this, it's easy to say, well, if God is in control, then how does sin and evil happen? Does that fall outside of the will of God? And that is a question that could receive a sermon series of its own. But in the time that we have here, I'll just say to you that God can even use evil to accomplish his purposes. In Genesis 50, 20, Joseph tells his brothers who had sold him into slavery that what they had meant for evil, God had meant for good. Proverbs 16, 4 says, The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked, for the day of trouble. In Acts 2.23, the Apostle Peter says that even the crucifixion of Jesus, which was an evil act committed by evil people, was according to the will of God. So the testimony of Scripture is that there is a will of God, a sovereign decree of God that is going to come to pass no matter what. However, then you look at passages like the Ten Commandments. Let's take just one of the Ten Commandments, for instance, where God says that we are not to murder. This revelation that murder is evil actually goes back much farther than the Ten Commandments. God makes it very clear in the Bible that he is against taking the life of another human being. So in light of that scripture, is it God's will for you to go and murder someone? Please shake your head no. Good. But do people still get murdered? Yes, sadly they do. Are those murders the will of God? The issue that we wrestle with as students of the Bible is that it seems like we either have to say that those murders were within the will of God, which goes against the Bible, or to say that those murders are outside of God's control, which also goes against the Bible, 
And so the position that a great many theologians have come to is to say that there are times when the Bible talks about the will of God in a different sense than at other times. The main crux of this teaching is that there is what is sometimes called the moral will of God or the revealed will of God. This refers to the righteous nature of God that is revealed in the Bible and is seen in places like the Ten Commandments. And while it is not God's will that someone murder someone else, he doesn't forcefully impose his moral will upon mankind. This is where our free will as human beings comes into play. The other sense in which the Bible talks about God's will is what many theologians call the secret will of God. Personally, I don't really like that term because it makes it seem like God has something to hide. Perhaps a better way to think about it would be to call it God's plan for history. God has planned the progress of history, and what the future holds is yet to be revealed. God knows that, though, because he planned it in the first place. That's why some people call it God's secret will, because he knows the plan and we don't. And when it comes to the great comprehensive plan that God has for the universe, nothing is going to throw that plan off the rails. Everything that God wills is going to come to pass. And so thinking about these two facets of God's will, his revealed will and his will that is yet to be revealed, which aspect of God's will do you think that Jesus is talking about in this verse? Well, the text of Scripture really doesn't demand that we specify one or the other. All that this says is that we should pray that God's will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Based on the text itself, it would seem that it is safe to take a unified view of the will of God here. That we can look both at God's revealed will in the here and now and his sovereign decree for the future that is still at work. And it's interesting to me that Jesus pairs this with the prayer that God's kingdom would come. Because that is going to happen as all of history is crescendoing to the moment when God's will is fully carried out here on earth. We can't see the end result of God's purposes from here. But we should long for the day when we can. We should earnestly pray that the day will soon come when God receives the glory that he is due. And at the same time, there is no clear indication in this text that this prayer has to only look forward. Jesus says that we should pray that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's revealed will, his moral law, is followed in heaven. Is it always followed on earth? No, it is not. And so as we pray that God's will be done on earth in the here and now, there are several areas of our lives where this prayer should have an impact. The first area is that you must be a believer to be in line with this verse. And that might sound like it doesn't have much to do with this verse, but the Bible makes it clear that there is a universal gospel call going out from God that commands people to repent and turn to him for salvation. In Acts 17.30, as Paul is preaching at Athens, he says that God commands all men everywhere to repent. Not all will obey that command, and yet that is a command that God has revealed to us in his word. And can you truly pray that God's will would be done when you are refusing to obey his command yourself? I would say that you cannot. And so the place that you have to begin from is the realization that you are a sinner, that you have fallen short of the standard of a holy God. You have to truly believe in your heart that God came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ and lived the perfect life that you never could. You have to believe that Jesus Christ went to the cross and took the punishment of your sins upon himself and died for your sins. And you have to believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That three days after he was crucified, he was raised up from the dead by the power of God. That is the gospel that Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. And Jesus Christ offers salvation. And in the book of Acts, we see the way to receive this gift of salvation. 
what we know as conversion is all about a twofold turning. In Acts 14, 15, Paul preaches that his audience must turn from these vain things to a living God. In Acts 20, 21, we see Paul once again preaching of, and I quote, repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. The two parts of conversion are repentance and faith. You must turn from your sins in repentance and you must turn to Christ and place your faith in him as your only hope of salvation. Simply believing that God exists isn't going to save you. Coming to church isn't going to save you. Getting baptized isn't going to save you. Taking communion isn't going to save you. The only way to be saved from eternal condemnation is through turning from your sins in repentance and turning to Christ in faith for salvation. And this is a gospel message that has been preached countless times from this platform. And yet it is a message that must be proclaimed over and over again because I have no doubt that in a church even this size, there are those who have never been saved by the grace of God. I don't know your heart. And I'm not trying to scare you, but it would also be foolish to assume that every single person who attends here is saved. And we all know the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. But right after that, in John 3, 18, Jesus says that whoever does not believe in him is condemned already. If there has never been a time when you have turned from your sin and godly repentance, the wrath of God is directed at you right now. You are already under condemnation. Please, if you have never turned from your sin and turned to Christ for salvation, please do not put this off another day. Talk to me as soon as we're done here. Talk to Pastor Doug as soon as we're done here. Don't walk out of here today and allow yourself to deny the gospel call of God a moment longer. Today is the day of salvation. If we are to truly pray that God's will would be done, we must be followers of Christ ourselves. Secondly, maybe you're sitting there and you know that you're saved, but you're harboring sin in your heart. Maybe there is a part of your life that you know that is not pleasing to God, and yet you continue to harbor that sin. This verse doesn't say, your will be done in everyone except myself. We're very good at praying that others would do God's will, but we're not very good at rooting out sin in our own lives. I know what a temptation it is to hear a preacher say something and think, man, I sure hope so-and-so is listening right now because they sure need this. Maybe you've thought that about me before. If so, I probably did need it. But we should be quick to look at our own heart and say, God, where is my heart or my life not honoring to your will. God's will being done on earth includes us. And the third point of application that we can make here is that this is God's will. We're good at praying that our will would be done. All too often, most of our prayer requests are centered around getting our own will to come to pass. How often do we look at a situation and pray simply that God's will would be done. Not our own, but God's. I've seen an incredible example of this in the past couple of weeks in the life of two people that Brittany and I went to school with. This couple is expecting their second child, and a couple of weeks ago, they had an ultrasound, and the doctor discovered that one side of their baby's heart is severely deformed. It isn't going to be capable of pumping blood through this baby's body like it should. And this guy that we went to school with posted on Facebook last week that the doctor told them that there is a very slim chance that their baby will survive. He said that doing surgery would be extremely dangerous and even if by a miracle this child lives and makes it to adulthood, they're going to need a heart transplant. And he said that even as they were looking at this ultrasound, as they were watching their little child move around with their arms and legs and little fingers and toes, The doctor was pressuring them to have an abortion, to end the life of this child. Well, they obviously refused, and they are praying desperately for this child. 
But at the end of this post, they said that they obviously are praying that God will allow their child to live. But their biggest desire is just that God's will would be done and that he would be glorified. They said, we obviously desperately want our child to survive. But they said, even if God's will is not that our child survive, we just want God's will to be done. And we pray that even through that, he would be glorified. I have to be honest with you, if I were in that situation, I don't know that I would have the faith to pray that. And yet these two people are living examples of what it means to pray that God's will would be done. Not their will, but God's will. And this brings together the two halves of this verse. When Jesus said to pray, your kingdom come, the word that he used in the Greek carries the sense of kingship or of power. We ought to pray that the kingship of God would be established and carried out here on earth, both now and in the future. We ought to be kingdom-minded people who long for the coming of our king here on earth and in the meantime live as kingdom citizens in the here and now. We ought to pray that God's will would be done in every aspect of our world. And that prayer must begin with our own heart. As you go throughout your life this week, Take some time to pray that God's kingdom would come and that his will would be done. And there's no time like the present to start doing that. So I'm going to give you just a moment to take this request before our Father, and then I'll close this. Just there in your seat where you're sitting, let's all bow our heads and approach the throne together to ask the Lord that his kingdom would come and his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's pray.